Excellent. So uh, thank you, Steve. Uh, Lorenzo Volpi, Deputy CEO of Lederal Capital Partners. I was asked by Steve uh, not to give a full introduction of our guests because you all have the program and you can find the bios of, the, of our guest uh, there. But so very quickly, I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Evelyn from PGGM, Michael from LGT, morning. Bernard from Hoop, and Jason from Gallagher. So before uh, I ask, uh, you know, I go into the questions with our guest, maybe I'll just make uh, three quick comments uh, just on what just uh, following what Steve just said. So uh, the combination of the elevated premiums, but also the strong collateral return, which I think is a very important topic because we want to see what will happen in terms of investor uh, sentiment when we start seeing interest rates starting going down, hopefully, you know, in the near future, led to fantastic returns in 2023. It was the best year ever for uh, investors in terms of uh, the returns that we made. And but not only for our asset class, but we basically outperform most of the alternative asset classes, which, are, which is obviously very relevant when we want to uh, increase the awareness for the ability for investors to access ILS. Now, this occurred despite the losses that uh, we had in 2023. In 2023, the estimated industry losses were about 120, 125 billion. And this came from a number of events, uh, you know, the bulk of it from convective storms in the US, which was slightly higher than 50 billion. Then we had floods in New Zealand, Hurricane Otis in Mexico, the earthquake in Turkey, to, make, to mention a few. Now, it's clear that uh, now 100 billion industry losses per annum seems to be the new normal. But it's also clear that most of the ILS managers have learned some lessons. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest tasks for us has been how we demonstrate to investors that we've learned from the past. At the same time, we also recognize that most of these insurance losses have been retained by the insurers. So the outcome of the reinsurance company has been very profitable, but not very much so for the insurance companies, which means that uh, their profit profitability has been under pressure, but also their need for reinsurance continue to increase. The good news is that the higher demand of, range of reinsurance has been met with a record level of alternative capital that has been over, again, these are all estimates, but it's around $100 billion. And uh, as Steve mentioned earlier, we also witnessed the record uh, of issuance of cut bonds with 11 spawn, new sponsors plus uh, a number of returning sponsors to the market. So having said that, maybe if we start with uh, Evelyn, uh, in terms of uh, you know, investor sentiment, uh, obviously you've been uh, investing in this sector now for many years. You're probably the biggest you know, investor out there. So how has the sentiment evolved at your firm, not just uh, within your team maybe, but also within the investment committee when uh, you had to present the opportunity? Yeah, well, I think we're in a much better place than we uh, were a couple of years ago. So that's, uh, that's good. 2023 is a good year. 2022 was um, not great, but from a diversification perspective, which is one of the reasons why we invest in ILS, was still decent. Um, so that's, that's good. Um, going forward, I think rates are great. Retentions are really at the place where they need to be. Um, so that's, that's good. And in, in addition to that, as you already mentioned yourself, there were definitely lessons learned. So I think also risk has kind of recalibrated over the last couple of, uh, of years. So from a risk adjusted perspective, I think it's, um, we're, we're, we're actually in a place where we would like to be. Thank you. Uh, Bernard, what is your view on that? Um, well, I, I would echo what Evelyn has said. Uh, 2023 was a, a good year, which we really needed as an industry. Um, the, the fund uh, that I work for has been in ILS for four years. Um, and, um, you know, I think that it, it's, it's um, the, the investment committee 
the board are through, still sort of going through that education process of getting comfortable with ILS and reinsurance as a space. And so we've had some difficult years, but we, we now have marked a, a finally a, a very good year. Uh, but it's, it's not enough to really cement that, that conviction. I think it's going to require you know, longer term. Uh, we, we can't see rates and uh, terms and conditions sort of plateau and then come down very quickly. We need to maintain discipline going forward. And remember, this is a long-term play. Uh, we're going to be in this market for, for, for many years. Uh, but we'll scale up and down according to, to where um, pricing and a whole host of, of factors uh, are. So one year doesn't make um, you know, a great asset class. We need a continued um, sort of dynamic that is similar to 2023. Thanks. And, and Michael, obviously you told to various investors around the world. So what is your, uh, you know, the feedback that you can share? So I think from our end, we have seen a cycle, as we all know, and I think what defines a cycle is, is a lag. And on the investor side, what we have experienced is a group of investors that have allocated to the strategy for years and have started to retreat after we have seen an increase uh, in loss activity. And of course, climate change is always a topic that you need to discuss with investors, but it's ultimately it's down to results. And we have seen results being under pressure for European ILS managers and European investors, additionally, there was this challenge of the FX exposure. So if you hatch a dollar stream of returns into euros or Swiss francs, uh, it, it, you will lose another 300 basis points in, in the worst years, worst in terms of rate differential. And if you then only generate low single digit levels of return after losses, so if you still have a bit of a loss, but you're still positive and then you eat away another 300 basis points, we also need to live, so there is a bit of a management fee attached to that, and then there is not much left. And so certain investors have started to retreat. Now, 2023 was a great year, as we all know, but we also all understand there have been special effects on that year, including uh, some recoveries and some spread tightening in the aftermath of Hurricane Ian. Uh, also, the much higher collateral return helps, of course. And so your question on how do I gauge on how do we see investor interest, it's coming back. And I unfortunately almost fear that it's coming back hard. And I guess we're in close discussions with the, you know, the, the teams from the securities groups to manage flows. Because if, if I look back the last 15 years, I've been doing ILS, I guess the key challenge for the market and for ILS managers is managing interests, managing investor interest and managing deal flow to, to become, uh, to, to get to an optimal level. And so there has been a lag. In 2023 has been great, but of course it has been great because there was a, a lack of capital. And I guess time will tell now for the next months to come whether investor interest will return and whether deal flow will match. I guess that's then a good lead. And uh, what about you, Jason? Obviously you have a different perspective uh, given that at Gallagher you are very active in the car bonds uh, and cycles and... Uh, yeah, so... From our perspective, from the perspective of the ILS funds we talked to, uh, 2023 was obviously a stellar year. Um, as we look at forward inflows, it does seem like there's generally, as we talk to ILS investors, there's, there's money coming in. However, I don't think it's the same velocity that it has been in the past. Um, generally, it's still harder to, to, to raise capital for collateralized re mandates than it is for the, the more liquid cap bond funds. Uh, but we are seeing some have success in that arena as well. Um, we've heard from one or two ILS funds that have said they have some opportunistic investors that came in last year that are taking some money off the table in, in 2024. I don't think that's a broad, uh, across the board uh, sentiment, but there are, for those investors, it's sort of matched inflows and outflows. I think generally, from the end investors, there's still a concern, the typical concerns over climate change and modeling risk, but to some extent, those are um, alleviated a little bit with just how far rates have gone up over the last several years. Um, so I think generally among the ILS funds, sentiment's uh, pretty positive at the moment. Okay, thank you. Bernard, you made a good point in terms uh, of the sustainability of the market, right? I mean, they, we, we all know that. So last year, we were, we were all discussing, let's hope we have a good year next year. 
because investors, you know, we keep saying about premiums increasing year on year, we keep saying about terms and conditions getting tighter and more favorable. However, investors really want to see that in the ultimate performance. So now we had a stellar year. However, we know how the market works now. We could argue that uh, you know, this is, uh, the market is totally restructured. So the big difference maybe between now and post Andrew or post Katrina Ritt and Wilma is that uh, you know, premiums have readjusted across the board because insurance companies want to be profitable on the liability side and not just invest their premiums to make money on the asset side, which was the old model in a way. However, we know that uh, maybe in you know, the next renewal, hopefully not, uh, you know, it would be, you know, the pressure won't be so high, but we'll have to give up something, right? Uh, so what do you think uh, if uh, when we start negotiating, you know, where would you be more flexible in uh, letting it go, let's say? <coughs> My short answer would be don't be flexible. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, what I'm thinking about is, you know, there are a number of factors that play into this, I think. I've been in the market since, you know, late 2005, so I've seen the aftermath of, uh, of that year. And the investor base, I think everybody, you know, in the space has gotten more sophisticated. I think the investor base has gotten more, more comfortable and more knowledgeable about the asset class. Um, and so we've gone, some of us have gone through that, that long cycle. Um, and are maybe a little bit wiser about the capabilities of, of, of models of, of ourselves collectively to evaluate risk and price risk. Um, so I think that, that plays into it. We've been there before. We've, we've, we've seen the ups and the downs. Um, we know what's coming next, right? And so let's try not to repeat maybe the same mistakes we, we went through last year. And then you've got climate change, which you know is a a significant concern across the board on the end investor side. And, um, you know, you have to question, you, I mean, you also another factor that you have to consider is also the evolution of, of the modeling technology, the, the modeling vendors, et cetera, how they've evolved their platforms, um, how much, you know, have the, the risk models really improved significantly? Are they lagging? Do they um, look at physical climate change in an intelligent, intelligent way. Um, there are many areas to work on, I think, to make sure this asset class continues to be really attractive. Um, so it's OK. Evelyn, what's your view? Um, my view is that it's, that question comes a little bit too, too soon, too early. Um, um, as Bernard mentioned, one year of, of great results is not good enough to um, well, to overcome the, the seven years before. So that's the first thing. Over time, uh, yes, uh, this is also not sustainable. And, and as we are reinsurer, insurer, we're all in this together. So th there should be something to converge to that's reasonable for, for everyone, given the uncertainty in the world, given climate change, all true. Um, if you ask um, which element I would prefer to, to stick to, uh, that's definitely structure. So going back to lowering retentions, given the amount of inflation that, we, with, that we've seen, I think we should not go there. Um, I find it difficult to comment on terms and conditions. From an anti-investor perspective, that's less fitable to us. So we see rates, clearly we see uh, risk profiles. Uh, so maybe uh, Michael is able to comment on that more uh, on terms and conditions. So ultimately, that, that leaves us with rate, where I do think over time that that will trend. Loud and clear. So Michael, then. Uh... Well, ultimately, the question is about cycle management, right? Yeah, absolutely. How do we manage the cycle? Yeah. My former boss at Swiss Re once said, cycle management is an HR issue. It's not a technical <laughs> question. <laughs> now, on our end, we... For us, the answer is really very simple. And it sounds a very oversimplified answer, but I, I truthfully mean it and then probably have to play it back to Evelyn. So what we do is we've been given a mandate to allocate money. The money will be put to work for the best terms and the best conditions. And then we report back to our investors what's happening in our market. Our investors will then have to take a decision. Is that market still worthwhile allocating to? Is the amount that I'm allocating in this market yielding the level of return that I want to see, very much also compared to 
other opportunities. We have to be mindful, companies that allocate into ILS, uh, the allocation to ILS is, is, is minimal, is anywhere between, in, in Switzerland, it would typically be two, three, max 4%. And 95, 96, 97% is allocated to other asset classes that are also having an outlook, that also show an opportunity of, of generating a return. So my mandate is I put the money to work and I report back where we see pricing, where we see the multiple, where we see also soft, of course, elements around uh, the allocation, terms and conditions, and then leave it to our investors to take the ultimate decision. I know it sounds oversimplified, but I feel that transparency is the best answer that I can give as an analyst manager. So I think we are, uh, the four of us are strongly aligned to make sure that uh, you know, yeah. this sector remains profitable over the long term before Jason you know, calls us up and try to squeeze us. So Jason, well, I, I give do us think your angle, you know, where you're going to start trying squeezing us. I, I do think the market has peaked and we're, we're, okay, you we're see? Start, uh, <laughs> beginning our descent. But I don't, I don't see a, a terms and condition degrading that, that quickly. Okay. Uh, but but I, I do think that will happen over, over time. How long, you know, to be determined. But I do think that will happen um, as we go through the cycle. Well, and then I think we just need to, as end investors, take our responsibility and, um, and also <coughs> reduce capital if we don't believe that the market is adequate. And I think also that will likely happen because we also learned from the past. And even though you do compare it to other asset classes, um, it still has a, a big opportunity of a huge drawdown and capital will be gone. And I think that's also something to, uh, to take into consideration. Maybe one additional comment here, uh, just as you mentioned, what we also see is it's, it's the responsibility of the end investor to find a suitable remuneration structure for the ILS manager. Because if the ILS manager, and of course, trying to pitch a bit our approach, we're working for a flat management fee. We consider ourselves to be a portfolio manager. We allocate the money and we put it to work and we work for a flat fee to compensate us for the work that we do. We don't charge performance fees. Because if you charge performance fees in our trade, of course, then there is the question on what is your ultimate goal as an ILS manager. If you're paid on performance fees, you're also trying to optimize performance, maybe not necessarily to the benefit of the investor, not necessarily managing risk in the appropriate way. And so it's, again, back to the end investor to manage the allocation and make sure that uh, ILS managers are compensated in a, a proper alignment of interest. Yeah, and, and we are, um, I mean, your camp, we don't pay performance fees. So, um, yeah, I think we consider this market still a beta. I don't want to, I think that's very... Um, it hurts a bit. Yes, I know. <laughs> it's not that we don't appreciate good underwriting and good risk selection. However, it's so dependent on whether there's an event or not that uh, I don't think that warrants a uh, performance fee. Yeah, I think the beauty is that there is flexibility, right? I mean, in terms of uh, what managers can offer between management fees, performance fees, and uh, ultimately we all listen to the clients uh, because there are some clients that maybe prefer actually to pay more performance fee, less management fees, uh, just to be more aligned with the manager. But, you know, that's uh, yeah. obviously we are flexible. <coughs> now, we know that uh, there are many ways to assess this asset class, right, in terms of the instruments. So we talk about the cap bonds, uh, we talk about uh, proper placements, whether it's through quota shares, excessive loss type of contracts, and so on. So, Bernard, in terms of your approach to the asset class, how has that evolved uh, in terms of your appetite? Um, I think it's been fairly stable over the years. So, you know, I've been in ILS since 2005 for, for a number of, of firms, um, and it's a, you know, institutional firms, and I think it's always been fairly stable, you know, and I think it's no secret we have, we manage our own internal CAD book, CAD bond book, um, and then allocate to fund managers and, and you know, participate in sidecars. Um, so there is definitely a little bit of, of adjustment that's being made from year to year on, on the relative weights of those three items. Uh, but we essentially play across the board uh, in terms of you know, um, insurance, reinsurance, retro, uh, you know, perils, et cetera. So we've got a fairly broad mandate. Um, you know, one, one item that I wanted to, to, to kind of add to the previous question or 
and this is relevant to this too. You know, I think um, I think the discussions are often very simplistic. You know, um, when I read it on on online or in a, a publication about you know, are investors coming in? Or are they has their uh, appetite to the asset class increased? Um, I think you have to remember that ILS. As Michael said, the allocation to, of a pension fund to ILS might be you know, anywhere between 1% and 3%. Um, that's not a lot. And um, especially when there are much more important dynamics going around in the world, um, ILS is really at the bottom of the to-do list, right, in terms of the, the, the investment or allocation committee. Or, uh, um, and, and so in our case, you know, I think we differ from some other in the investors in that we are involved in the markets directly on the CAD bond side. Um, and so we do have ways of, of, um, of managing our exposure um, in sort of intra-year. But to the broader investment community that's looking at all strategies within the fund, ILS usually does not, it doesn't even enter the discussion, right? So, uh, again, it goes well, back is to this. Is this because uh, you're not it's very small. active? It's just the size. It's just how, the size. It's, how it's scary a very small allocation. It it's not going to, it will never be much bigger than, you know, let's say 2%. Okay. And um, so keep that in mind. Um, ILS is not very scalable and it's not very liquid relative to other strategies. And, and that's a hindrance. So is, sure. there a, is there an angle there where maybe you could look at uh, add uh, different type of perils. So for example, later we have a session on cyber, uh, you know, to sure, just we're, make we're, it you know, like I said, relevant. we've got a pretty broad mandate, so we're looking at all the, the perils out there that share the same characteristics as property cat. Um, you know, low correlation to other strategies and asset classes, um, you, know, you know, credible and, and strong ability to quantify the risk and pricing environment, et cetera. So, Okay, well, probably the panel will discuss that later. But sure, you mentioned yeah. Diversification or local relation and ability to quantify the risk that doesn't really <laughs> apply maybe to some of those uh, specialty right. risks uh, that uh, you know, where we're trying to expand. Yeah, but, uh, I mean, you, yeah. You, 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 at the same time, you do have to, to educate yourself on new emerging risks yes. and sort of participate in the development of that, of that pocket of risk, really, okay. I think. Um, Thank you. Yeah, sorry, Mike. If I may, just one additional comment. This was, was a very interesting comment. What we see in Europe at times, we now have investors here on the panel with subject matter experts as part of the investment team. Many investors do not have that. Many investors are broader pension plans. Again, small teams allocating the variety of asset classes. What we have seen uh, in, in Europe, uh, and that's really just recent feedback that I've received, is certain pension funds have started to exit ILS for a very special reason. They had, 2023 was a good year, yes, we have to be mindful. Some of the life structures have seen a bit of an impairment, so overall uh, there were some events that did impact some of the allocations, and so some pension funds exited the asset class because it became too complicated. And if I say too complicated, you have to report back to a board of trustees and you have to explain to them what you do. And if you have to go back over and over and over again for, and to Bernard's point, for a small allocation, it's at one point just too painful. And you also do not want to defend the allocation. You don't want to be the one party in, uh, in the group of investment committee sort of members that say, oh, we should do ILS, we should do ILS, because you know there's a certain career risk attached to it. If something goes wrong, people will say, that was your pitch, you wanted it. So we've experienced now two concrete cases in Switzerland where large pension schemes decided to exit ILS for that reason, because the, the responsible person, not a subject matter expert, did not want to continue justifying the asset class, even though he personally then said, I love it and the outlook is great, but I've had it. And so that's a bit of a challenge. It's, this allocation is so small, it's such a niche, it's the complicated sort of, I would say. Yeah, I hear your comments. I think that we have a, duty as investors to make sure that we consolidate these returns and we prove that over the long term we can be profitable by dealing with risk that we understand and they understand rather than keep teaching them new lessons that might actually play against us in the future. But of course, again, at the same time, we are all very much in favor of the development of the market. So, you know, there are 
that the good news is there are always investors with different appetite up there, you know, out there that will uh, find reasons to do different things. But uh, in, there are you know, more conservative investors and, and other type of investors. Now, Evelyn, uh, in terms of uh, your allocation, again, you have uh, you know, been investing for a long time. You have yep. done a lot of different things. Uh, so is there something new that you want to add? Uh, are you just looking at consolidating what you have? Uh, well, we, I think we all know we're property cat only, uh, also for a reason that we speak to our board. So we have been investing since 2006, so very dedicated to the, to the asset class. We spent quite some time educating both internal as, as well as external stakeholders, making sure that also our board does understand what we do. So when it comes to other risks, they feel less comfortable. So that's where we um, do not get enough traction with them. Um, so they, for now, we continue to, to stick to property cat. And when it comes to our risk profile, I think that's very well defined. They all agree to that. Um, I think we have a slightly moderate risk profile, so maybe we did not suffer maybe as, as much as uh, some others did. Uh, th there were some, th that's, that's what you see with ILS. There's so many different investors that some have very uh, a, a strong risk appetite, so if they faced severe drawdowns in 2017, 18, we were not part of that, so we were able to still manage that uh, internally. Okay. And that is helpful. Jason, so at Gallagher, you guys have built a quite a sizable team in the capital markets area, and uh, obviously you are in charge of the distribution. Now, what are your goals? I mean, what, what would you love to achieve in terms of uh, augmenting the penetration or bringing new products uh, to the market? Well, I, I look at <clears throat> what's, the, what's the thesis of ILS. It's, it's really like you look back at when ILS started after Hurricane Andrew, it's really like where's the capital was really needed for cat reinsurance, right? And I look at where in the market is that need now, and I would point to cyber, and I know some of everybody has different views, and there's a whole panel on it. Um, so I, I would look at cyber as a, that could be a growth engine for our market uh, going forward. I think there's a tremendous need there. Uh, the, 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 there could be, you know, uh, everybody expects that market to, to grow quite a bit over the course of the next decade or whatever. Um, so I think we're going to, it's going to need capital markets participation. Um, the way investors are currently participating, it's into more of the commingled funds with, with NatCat. I think that somewhat limits cyber to maybe 5 to 10 percent of the, of, of, of the assets in this space. But I think the need is a lot bigger than that. So that's still a lot of runway for, for deals, but I think the need is bigger than that. So I think you need to see new investors in the space and then um, investors setting up funds, whether it's just that just invest in specialty lines, etc. So okay. I think going forward, that's a that could be a big uh, opportunity for our, our sector. So you mentioned new investors in the space. I think the big difference, and obviously I'm interested to hear uh, your view, Michael. The you know the big difference between uh, today and post uh, 17 uh, is that you know post 17 we used to call it the year of the great reload, right? I mean we had so much money coming in, we all had to close our funds uh, at one point, try to show that we, we were disciplined, and uh, you know this. Um, today is probably a different market, right? So we see interest, but how much interest? I mean, is, and uh, also from a geographical standpoint, how have you seen? Uh, the interest evolving. On our end, that's, the, the last point is an interesting one. We have seen, with, as a Swiss investment manager, of course, we started out in Switzerland 15, 20 years ago and, and raised a lot of money in Switzerland. And there's also some cyclicality to investor interest on a geographical scale, and that's an interesting comment uh, that you just made. So we are clearly seeing the, the, the sort of developed markets, if you will, uh, developed in terms of markets that have allocated for a long time in this space to take a bit of a sidestep, to take a bit, maybe take you know, some money from the table, maybe take a bit of a more cautious uh, approach. I've mentioned the two cases, the very recent cases, where it just became a bit too complicated to just, and people were starting to retreat. We now see a, a increased interest in 
I wouldn't call it developing markets, is of course, the very wrong term, but you see my point, in markets that have in the past not really allocated uh, a lot of money into the space. And uh, as an interesting point, we see a lot of new interest in markets where you believe they have already allocated and, and the market is sort of set, and that's Canada, for instance. I just traveled to Canada last week. I met with a, a couple of investors who either have allocated or are currently looking at the space, and the interest is, is really tangible. It's, it's, you can feel it. And uh, another market is Australia, where again, you would feel that, well, Australia, we've heard about Australia for years, and it's probably a saturated market. Well, apparently it's not. And there is a lot more money coming into the space in, in markets like Australia. Uh, and so we're seeing a revived interest in markets where you believe, well, they've had it and they, they should be saturated. But we see a declining interest in markets such as, again, Switzerland uh, is, is an overwhelming market where we clearly see a declined interest. And people don't even want to talk about ILS anymore. You call them up and say, can we talk about ILS? They say, no. And you can tell it takes a bit of time for the com sort of the, the committee composition to change and, and for, for sort of younger people to come in again or different people to come in again to start to have a fresh look because once you've allocated to certain space and you decided to exit, you cannot re-enter for the next three to five years. It's just because of the documentation that you've entered and, and submitted and, and the reason that you gave why you should exit. There has to be a fundamental shift and change and, and we're not necessarily seeing this. There's a bit of cyclicality. So that is, that is a, a challenge that we see. And then just on capacity, as I mentioned, I guess the biggest challenge, and I'm, I'm sure you, you support that statement, Lorenzo, the biggest challenge for an ILS manager is managing capacity. And you, you mentioned that after 2017, we have seen a lot of interest. We're now seeing a lot of interest again. We're dealing differently this time around with the interest. I think the, our entire organization has gone through a fundamental learning process on how you have to manage capacity at a company level, also this, within the sales team. We're working with fixed capacity levels. So we know exactly how much money we intend to take on for this year, because that's the type of money we, all else being equal, and of course, Jason, I hope you tell me a lot about the overwhelming pipeline. We see many, many deals, but right now, we are expecting healthy pipeline, we are expecting new deals, but we also manage capacity. And then the interesting bit is, and goes back a bit to pricing, and that means that we don't have to compete on price because we don't want and don't need to grow at any sort of cost. We know exactly how much we can deploy within our structures, within our sort of allocation strategy, and there is a glass ceiling to how big we can be. And that's, in my view, surprisingly low, that glass ceiling, because we still want to be selective, we still want to do the deals that we should be doing, want to be doing, and at one point we'll just close down and go golfing maybe. So, Evelyn, how do you manage capacity? Before you made, uh, you made a comment about, well, be careful out there because if premiums go down, then we pull it. So, yeah. you know, so, is it about relative value versus other asset classes? How do you look at it? So, in principle, we have a strategic allocation, um, um, but we were trying to convince our strategy department to, there's always a bandwidth around that, to have a much wider bandwidth than we currently have. So we can be larger in times when, when rates are, uh, are up and, and smaller in times when rates are down. Um, yes, I, I strongly believe that there was way too much capital uh, prior 2017 uh, in the system and, and clearly we were part of that. So if we can manage that going forward in a better and more efficient way, uh, we'll do so. And the burner? I, I think I echo the same sentiments. Um, you know, I, th I think, you know, the, the way, you know, I look at it, we have a, a, a particular, you know, maximum allocation to ILS. I'd like to stay below that, such that when I see, you know, really good opportunities, I, I, I don't have to go through a lot of, uh, sort of, uh, you know, um, sort of approvals to, to act quickly. Um, and um, I think that's, okay. so it's, it's fairly, you know, with, with an allocation to CAD bonds and allocation to the other stuff, I think, I think it's, it's fairly, um, makes it fairly easy to manage that, that capacity and, and take some money off the table when, when necessary. And to Michael's point about the pipeline, it does seem like the pipeline is, is pretty healthy and robust. Uh, and we have, speaking from, I don't know everyone's pipeline, obviously, but from our pipeline, it's, 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 it's relatively full. And, and from what I hear in the market, there, there could be several deals that are looking for significant amounts of, of capacity. So I, I think that's all helpful with 
right now there's, we're in a situation where there is a lot of money flowing around in the cap bond space just from maturities, coupons, end of year flows. So you, you have a situation where prices are getting bid up and spreads down. Just everybody's kind of waiting for that pipeline to really, really uh, ramp up, which I think it, it, we're in the process of doing now. And, and what about uh, you know, your feeling in terms of uh, interest from ultimate investors? So obviously you spend most of your time you know, pitching us as ILS managers uh, you know, for your products. But I assume there is also an element of uh, uh, learning or teaching to a wider community of investors uh, that uh, are just learning about it. Have you, have you, are you experiencing any interest in terms of ability to penetrate uh, new investors which came up three times earlier in terms yeah, of I th more money? I, th I think that was easier to do in the past, to be honest okay. with you. Um, almost everyone's heard of ILS now. If you go back when we were on the same team back in the day, you could, it was fertile ground. You could go into a pension. They've never heard of ILS, and you could teach them, et cetera, like you're saying. But I think now um, people have preconceived notions about the asset class, because almost everybody you go into has at least had somebody's been in there pitching or they've heard about the asset class. And I think it's helpful that we're, you know, that you, you see us in the, ILS is in the Financial Times and Wall Street Journal, and I think that helps educate folks as well that maybe don't hear about the space as much. Okay. I would have a, an additional question there to Jason. So what I've heard now talking to a couple of, of your peers is that there's an interesting development, uh, also new in interest, direct interest from fixed income managers that to buy cap bonds directly, yes. to not even go down the path I don't understand why, but don't even use ILS managers. So can you maybe elaborate on that? Yes, and there, there's always been an element of that, right? Um, and those will come in and out. I think we're in a situation now where, where spreads are, um, where spreads are, it makes sense to kind of educate yourself if you're a fixed income buyer. You kind of have some comfort in um, the fact that it's a syndicated product. Um, um, so so there's, there's, there's safety in numbers. So when you know, we, when you know that uh, folks like Michael Stahel and Lorenzo Volpe are looking at the, the cap bond and you participate with the, with the small bet, you have some comfort there. So you, I, you do see more <coughs> investors coming into the space, and I think that will continue if, if rates stay where they are. Actually, on, <coughs> you know, on that note, in terms of uh, you know, where we are uh, with regard to pricing, right? So we obviously started 2010. 23 with a dislocated market where uh, the average coupon for cap bonds were the highest ever, you know, back to the same levels post Katrina, Rita, and Wilma. And the same was for, uh, <coughs> for private placements, right? Now we've seen probably more money in 2023 chasing the liquid alternative space, so the cap bonds, with spreads that compressed. Now spreads are still very attractive. Again, I don't want to steal, you know, the talk to later, but. Uh, you know, they are still uh, uh, attractive on a relative basis. However, we are starting to see the decoupling of pricing between uh, private placements and capital. So, so maybe, Evelyn, in, in terms of your asset allocation, does it mean that you're going to maybe scale back from capital and increase a bit private placements, or you have uh, a different uh, take no. on that? I think no is the answer. So in principle, we um, were instrument agnostic. So. Um, we invest in cat bonds, uh, collateralized reinsurance, uh, in sidecars. Uh, we back a rated entity. Um, I think it's, in principle, we try to be strategic to our partners. Um, and, and yes, we do shift some capital if we see a large dislocation. But if it's in the in small amount, it, it, it's too large of an allocation. It, it's eight billion. You cannot. Uh, wiggle that around easily. So, uh, no, we, we don't. Then Bernard? Uh, <clears throat> I don't know if I have <clears throat> much more to add. I, I, I would say I would welcome more um, end investors actually getting closer to the risk and directly accessing the cat bond market. I think it would be healthy for, for the market um, not to take any business away from you guys. But, um, I, I think it, it would sort of elevate the level of discussion in, in terms of having more end investors really truly understanding the risk, underwriting, 
and and um, and being able, you know, adding to to the voice of end investors in terms of what they're looking for, uh, the areas that concern them, and sort of you know the daily nitty gritty details that that we care about when we we, we trade directly in the market. Um, and, and another item which hasn't been touched on, perhaps will later in the day, is transparency. Um, and I think, um, you know, transparency is key. It's very, very hard to enhance it, um, as many of the folks in this audience might uh, had discussions with me. Um, I've been trying to push for more transparency. And, and you know, at the end of the day, you know, you've got end investor capital, pension fund capital that is supporting reinsurance contracts. Um, I need more transparency on, 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 on those contracts, the seedings involved, the, the programs involved, the layers, such that I can look across the whole portfolio, across um, all products, and figure out, um, you know, get a better view of aggregation of risk, which I'm not just, I'm not getting out of a cat model, a risk model. Okay. Um, so more qualitative transparency or insight into, into the business. And the micro, are you seeing investors now starting to switch appetite from uh, more liquid to less liquid opportunities, or are still? Uh... Unfortunately, not. Okay. It's difficult to raise interest for uh, funds that allocate to private transactions. It's much easier to raise interest for pure capital strategies, and maybe it's a bit short-sighted by by investors uh, because they of course now look at, at uh, you know the, the past years not just 2023 because in 23 clearly uh, our strategies that allocate to illiquid positions by far uh, exceeded the returns for capital only funds but if you look back five ten years and just look at average returns uh, you know the strategies that allocate as we talked about more to frequency lower attaching deals of course went through a bit of a difficult cycle and so we now see and it's maybe a bit of a trend we see institutional investors allocating to pure cap on strategies, even regulated usage funds for European strategies. Investors that in the past would deem such a product to be a retail product, and we're institutional investors, we don't do retail products. And that, that attitude has clearly seen a change, and we see institutional investors moving into pure cap on strategies, uh, of course, because of liquidity. Even though I always question how much liquidity there's actually there. Yeah, actually, I, that, yeah. that is a very good point, right? I mean, the, I, I recently met uh, with uh, a consultant, uh, and I was really surprised by his, by his comment. He basically told me, Lorenzo, even if the funds have quarterly liquidity because you invest in a mix of private placement and carbons, uh, in reality, we need to look at this now as an illiquid asset class. Because if there is a big event that causes difficult to value positions, so you end up with a side pocket, then the side pocket could last, uh, well, he said five to ten years, that is a bit harsh. But, uh, you know, the, and, and uh, so that, even if that is a very small percentage of the overall allocation, then it means that uh, the asset class is illiquid. And that obviously, you know, brought me back to the structuring features uh, of the car bonds versus the private placements. And of course, a car bond, if uh, there is an event, uh, uh, then uh, you could have an extension mechanism, which uh, basically uh, extend uh, the maturity of the bond for an additional three years. Uh, and uh, probably the price of the bond uh, is very depressed, uh, trades at five if you're lucky. And where else in the private placement, maybe you don't uh, value so drastically the asset, uh, but uh, you try to do your best uh, to recover the money until the very last minute. So we could argue that uh, you could also exit from a private placement if you either take a full loss uh, or offer a very low price for it, right? So I think it's just a perception of uh, the two markets. So there is a, also an element uh, of making sure that we do maybe a better job uh, when the investor look at our asset class to explain the dynamics of what happens past event, which in the past we were all worried about, right? I mean, we, we, different managers have different attitudes. But maybe, you know, Michael, what is your view on, uh, you know, the difference between the two assets and how would you treat, uh, you know, both? Uh, well, uh, carbons we know is independent valuation, but how would you look at the private placement side just to give more comfort to investors and tell them, guys, there is an end to it. It's not something that goes on forever. Well, I would, I would still argue that a cap on is a liquid asset and it's tradable at any given point in time. You may not like the price, you may not like the spread, but you can sell it. 
even if, during the development period, there will be a price to it. Uh, so if you want to, just walk away. There is a price to it, and it's easier. Of course, there's always also a price to a private deal. You can always negotiate an exit on a private deal uh, and leave some money on the table, and it's the same mechanism. But on the capital side, it's just much easier. And there are, in fact, a couple of traders' uh, names that only appear every five to six years. And if you know, you know, and if you get a call from these guys, then <laughs> you know you have some positions that you may not want to hold on to. So there is always a, there's always a price for capital. Uh, maybe. On the private side, it depends a bit on how you approach the private market, clearly. That's the question. How do you structure these transactions? And there are different ways, as we all know. We, on our end, spend quite some time trying to get more efficient in this area, simply because we're working in, in a more conservative space where risk and return has seen a, a lot of sort of pressure over the years, and so taking, taking enabling a more efficient solution, making sure that we don't pay too much for the structure in between, maybe making sure our investors are not allocating part of the return to just cost for the structures. We spend quite some time on that, and I think the, the, the key solution, and I, I, I probably Evelyn will, will confirm that, is of course running a, a, a reinsurance entity within your profit center that allows for the, to do structuring in-house and to allow to engage into the deal directly with the clear benefit of you don't have to post any excess collateral. So if you have a deal in development, well, you have a reserve. Of course, you follow the reserving of, of the counterparty once you trust the reserving of the counterparty. Uh, and there is no excess collateral blocked in any way. So you can roll and, and reallocate all the money that you have. And yes, if there is adverse development, of course, you still suffer. I mean, no one is safe from adverse loss development. But I think Hurricane Ian showed that it can also go the other direction. But I think. Having the structure in place to enable these private transactions, control the entire value chain of the, di of the direct transaction is key, to then also allow for an exit. We've negotiated exits now on certain deals uh, from previous years, 20, 21, 22, uh, very efficiently at, at, at very comfortable terms. Actually, you made a very good point on uh, being exposed to adverse development, because when you think, you know, as a, as a sector, at the very beginning, we, re we all trade tried very hard to give comfort to investors that uh, none of the events that occurred before they invested could have affected them, right? But then uh, we've seen that it's almost impossible, right? Uh, and, uh, and then uh, if we think about the equity market, and the equity market, you invest in the stock, and then the fluctuation of the value of the stock pretty much depends on what you know, they, the investors hear during a quarterly call. Uh, about the reserves and whether the insurance company is going to increase reserves or decrease the reserves, so good news or bad news. So why wouldn't it be the same for our asset class, right? So that's probably something again to bring up and say, guys, you know, we, can't be, we cannot be perfect. I mean, this is a world of unknown, unknown, and known, unknown, and uh, we only discover things by experience similar to all the other markets, right? It's not just us. Now, conscious of time, we only have 10 minutes left. so. If there are any questions from the audience, then I'm sure our panelists will be very pleased to address them. Do we have a, do we have a microphone for the, for the gentleman for the end of the room there? Thank you. Hey, everybody. Um, I'm Jeff Reinhardt from Augment Risk. How do you guys view an ILS product that's more frequency driven versus severity driven, like a casualty ILS product that might be a bit longer tail? Maybe, maybe, maybe I'll start. I mean, the, the, the longer tail has always been a big headache, right, for our industry. I mean, we, when we started looking at, I remember, like a, a deal that we all tried to structure in the old days, uh, which was for AXA on a casualty book. And in the, in the end, we managed to get the cut bond out there, but the reason was that AXA was very comfortable about taking the tail back after a number of years, simply because they had a very good, good handle of their budgeted versus actual loss ratio. And because they also knew how to talk to the regulator in terms of getting capital efficiency driven by solvency too. However, is you know, when, uh, and I know there are, you know, products out there, you know, my, my worry is always to underestimate the IRR 
given that at a certain point in time you probably need a third party to provide evaluation, to provide the commute, and we know that the evaluation could be painful. So that's, uh, but you know, obviously, as far as, I, I always think that as far as we try to be as transparent as, as possible and explain carefully to the investor exactly what it means and how it works and work together with the sponsor so that we are all aligned, then of course, you know, we can execute those deals without any issues. But, uh, you know, transparency and making sure that everyone understands what it means, it's absolutely key. Uh, the, but please, I'm sure the, our panelists have their own views. Uh, Bernard, do you have any? <clears throat> we haven't looked much at the casualty market, but, you know, the long tail nature of, of that product is, is definitely an issue. I would also say sort of the, you know, going back to fundamentals, Modeling the risk and understanding the risk is, is also an issue. So I think it comes down to it would come down to portfolio construction, etc. Um, but yeah, you know, I think there are definitely some complications with that with that product from our point of view. Michael, do you have any view? Or I always I always have a view. You know me. No? Um, I, we have a, a very distinct view. In fact, I at LGT, we fundamentally believe that the reinsurance world and the reinsurance industry, and especially reinsurance carriers, capitalized reinsurance carriers, that system works. It worked for the last 150 years. So there needs to be a reason for ILS capital to flow into the space, and the reason in our view, we're very, very simple there. The reason is because for certain massive peak exposures under the solvency regime, Reinsurance companies are maxed out, and they simply don't want to take that risk anymore. It's not attractive for a Swiss Re to ride more Florida risk because they have fully allocated everything. Maybe they can hedge it out, that's why they issue cap bonds, but they are at the level of risk they want to accept. And if there is a, another Florida carrier that is looking for Florida exposure, a call up Swiss Re, it might be a matter of price at one point, but at one point it's not a matter of price anymore. It's simply, this is it. Yeah. This is how much we are willing to lose for a Cat 4 hurricane that hits Miami. And then there's the question of who's taking the rest. And this is where the capital market is the most efficient solution. Because we have large pension plans that can use this allocation as a diversifier. It's an event-driven, clear-cut transaction. There's a big event, you pay. There's no event, you don't pay. We all walk away. For everything that comes with the tail, with, to Bernard's point, challenges around assessment, modeling, and to your point, with the tail element and the development element, I don't think the ILS market should even become active in this space. I, I just blurted out here, I don't think that's something that ILS should be doing. There are many, many well-run reinsurance companies on the planet that are really <laughs> specialized in taking exactly that risk. They know what they do, and they have the time to it. They can sit on it for 25 years. It doesn't matter. Their equity will never go away. Sorry, that was very loud and a I, very I, clear I statement. I think that's, I echo that, that point. I think it's a very good point you're making about the fact that the, you know, there's, the purpose of the ILS market should be complementary to the traditional market and remain complementary. And we have to be careful of, of not, of, of deviating from that because then we, we might get in trouble. Um, and that applies to emer some, certain emerging risks like cyber, um, again, uh, you know, there has to be a, a clear motivation for the risk being transferred to capital markets. For, for me, there is always a role, uh, it's down to transparency. I mean, making sure that they really understand what we're doing. So that's... Uh, well, at least uh, the cyber risk is, is, is a systemic risk. Yeah. So that's maybe different from... I agree. Uh, yeah. Casualty or long tail. Any other questions? Yeah. Microphone, please. Thank you. So you guys have all mentioned uh, cyber risk a few times, um, and I think we've seen a few bonds done recently. Uh, could you speak a little bit to the investor acceptance and buy-in to the cyber modeling and really the quantifiability and the lack of correlation and kind of how is that journey coming along? Because it seems like th things are happening now. I can start off if you don't mind. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's I okay. Mean, it's I, think sort of we're, I think we're in the early stages of that process, right? So we've, we've seen the market scene for uh, 144A cap bonds being issued. Um, 
there is, there is a pretty wide margin on those transactions for the reason that you're, you're mentioning, right? So, so there is some uncertainty on, mod, on modeling and that's why you're getting that extra, um, uh, that's why you're getting that extra spread. I think that will come down as investors uh, you, you know, get educated on the asset class and I think there are more and more investors will continue to uh, participate. Right, there's a there's a good subset of investors that that are bought into that market now, and more and more that it was it's just a matter of them educating their end investors, and that process is ongoing. I think so. By the end of the year, I think you'd see a lot more investors in that space than there are today, and that'll continue to grow. I think it's early days. I, I think it's more of an experimental kind of product right now, and. You know, we definitely, I think, from my point of view, we want to educate ourselves on the risk. Uh, but at the same time, you know, I want to see the insurance and reinsurance industry show me that they can deal with a, a large event and, and they can manage that risk too. Because I don't think it should be transferred to investors if, if you know, the traditional market can't handle it. That's not the purpose of ILS. We are in the same camp of learning about it. We just don't allocate to it. So that's an <laughs> easy answer uh, for the same reasons. Um, I think, well, at least I don't fully understand it, first of all, which I think is by far the most important reason. And secondly, I, I also question uh, whether you would do cyber in, in bond format to really sit on the other side of the risk where there's so much, um, there's, uh, an information asymmetry where I would not be comfortable with. I guess that opens up a good discussion in the afternoon for the cyber session. On our end, uh, we this is currently outside of our business mandate, so that's a simple answer. Yeah. The sort of slightly longer answer is also maybe, I don't want to cite you, but, but you've mentioned that it's a systematic risk. We can see that cyber as an exposure and as a risk could have a similar level of, of sort of impact on the, on, on, on the balance sheets of the large reinsurance companies to then ultimately justify a capital markets transaction. So there I'm, I'm fundamentally positive towards the topic, not so much uh, you know, frequency covers and long tail covers, but this is a true, it could be a global crisis, global catastrophe. Do we have enough capital to support that? Uh, the only challenge that I see right now is the fact that our investors are looking for a an uncorrelated allocation that should help them to survive extreme stresses in financial markets. And arguably, a, a large cat cyber event could, could mean we have a strong impact in financial markets as well. But then again, you can take the same argument for earthquakes in, in, in California. We'll like to also have an impact on stock, stock prices. Yeah, the, the, the comment about diversification, it's a key one for us as well in terms of, uh, you know, you have a macro shock and then suddenly you have a loss on cyber and uh, when property cash should not be affected. So that would be a bad surprise for investors. Now, I'm not sure, Steve, whether we have uh, more time for an additional question or if there is an additional question. question. But I think we're, okay, there is maybe one last question there. Yeah, okay, because you have 18 seconds. <laughs> 15. <laughs> All right, I have a similar question to the first one. Frequency versus uh, severity. Uh, I'm Hong Guo from Arbol. We're a parametric specialist. Uh, so capital market does a good job in providing additional capital for large events. I was wondering uh, what your think, thoughts are for the frequency uh, events where there's still a, a big gap uh, for the students. Uh, is this a good strategy for the, the investors to allocate. Thank you. Bernard, do you want to cover this? Um, I, I'm always a little bit confused by this dichotomy between frequency and severity because I, I look at sort of the holistic risk profile, the you know, risk that we're taking on. Um, you know, I would say at the end of the day, there's no bad risk, but only mispriced risk. So you, you have to, you know, if you can price that frequency risk well and, and really get paid for it, you know, it's a good starting point. Um, I think maybe I'll, I'm looking at it from a different perspective. Yeah, I think already within property cut, we are looking at the difference between frequency and severity, right? I mean, 
there's been a lot of focus from ILS managers uh, since 17 and 18 on climate change and how we mitigate the impact of climate change. And the, the, the obvious outcome for all of us has been, okay, we need to make sure that more risk is retained, as Evelyn you know, mentioned earlier. At the same time, uh, we need to make sure that uh, we try to shy away, if possible, from secondary perils. Because when you look at the, ag the cumulative losses caused by secondary perils over the last 20 years have been higher by probably estimated 200 to 300 billion than the cumulative losses caused by the primary perils, the peak perils. So, you know, frequency also in property cut uh, has been on our radar in terms of, also because secondary perils are more difficult to model and price, uh, which again goes back to Bernard point in terms of are you compensated enough or not. Maybe one additional comment to that. I, first of all, I, I think I've noticed over the last 24 months that the industry was trying to change to using the word frequency instead of aggregate, because aggregate seems to be a bad word now, so we're talking frequency calls. But if you look at an insurance company, an insurance company has to meet regulatory cap requirements. And regulatory cap requirements stipulate that you have to survive a certain return period of losses. And so what you do is you cut out uh, extreme events which means that you're left with a, and currently, much larger retention level because all, all the markets have started to shy away from low attaching covers, so you end up with a large block of losses, mid-sized losses that you have to retain uh, as part of your own balance sheet protection. And your balance sheet only has a certain strength to it, and at one point, there will be not enough money left. And we know that certain companies have bled out with frequency type of events. And so I can see that from a regulatory point of view, as an insurance company, you want to buy the cover or you have to buy the cover and you have to pay the price to Bernhard's point. The challenge for us now as an ILS manager is very simple. An insurance company has a much better understanding about their average loss burden, their expected loss. And if I say expected loss, I mean, what is our average cap loss that we're running in any given year based on our portfolio. And so then they say, well, we're losing, making up numbers here, we lose $500 million every, every, every year from these mid-sized events. Let's buy a cover at 550. Is that enough of a gap for me to have, okay, to say, okay, this is really, it's becoming a bad year. Does it have to be 600, 800, 900? Some companies have been extremely good in ultimately almost exploiting the market with their advanced knowledge about their, their underlying portfolio strategy, where they see growth, where they see accumulation, mini accumulations within their portfolio. So where do you set that level? And it's extremely hard to capture that. So my view there is very simple and probably also again back to Bernard's point. Then I would rather participate in a quota share agreement, sharing, fairly sharing losses and returns for the entire portfolio and use that to cut down your, your frequency sort of type of event. So my answer would be, we on our end clearly have no interest in, in growing our frequency allocation. And I'm not saying we don't do aggregate cap bonds because we can also have cat frequency and that's, that's fine, that's, that's perfectly fine, but not the low level frequency. Uh, we've, I have to admit, burnt our fingers and we don't want to go back there. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>